but he's now advocating a controversial new proposal for public housing to rely more on private financing. And he's back in New York today to, uh, specifically to help make President Obama's case that the stimulus bill is growing the private economy, not just government spending. So we have a lot to talk about. Secretary Donovan, welcome back to WNYC and to New York. It's great to see you, Brian. Thanks. From today's Washington Post, the Obama administration has set off a pitch debate among housing officials and advocates by promoting far-reaching legislation to overhaul the way the nation's 2,400 public housing authorities operate with potentially major ramifications for their 2.3 million residents. At the heart of the bill is a bold proposal to encourage housing authorities to rely more heavily on private financing to pay for their $30 billion in renovation needs. But critics fear the measure could introduce a range of problems, most notably a loss of of public housing, should the properties end up in private hands. Tell us what you're proposing. Well, Brian... First of all, let's be clear of the problem we're trying to solve here. Uh, We've been losing 10,000 units of public housing a year for the last 15 years. And there really isn't any prospect that we're going to be able to get an infusion of 20 to $30 billion of, of funding that public housing needs around the country just by looking to Congress. Uh, our, our financial uh, troubles are too serious. At, at the same time, o- over the last half century since public housing stopped being built, we've developed all of these uh, innovative new ways to create affordable housing that involve the private sector. And let's be clear, when we, when we say the private sector, we mean the whole range of nonprofits in New York City and around the country that have been so successful. And so what really what we're trying to do is bring public housing into the 21st century. And that doesn't just mean bringing in new capital, but too many people around the country still think of public housing as the projects. It is something separate from the neighborhoods that surround it. And, and part of the reason for that is that it's almost impossible to bring a grocery store into, into public housing, to bring the kind of services, to make real communities and neighborhoods out of public housing. So that's really what we're trying to accomplish, is to open public housing, just like every other kind of affordable housing can do that today. The Post quotes two members of Congress as being especially critical, Maxine Waters and Barney Frank. The Post says Frank's skepticism centers on what will happen if housing projects that have borrowed to renovate go into foreclosure. And that could happen, right? I mean, look at Stytown here in New York. It's not public housing, but a big project's new owners getting in over their heads. And, you know, Barney Frank, Maxine Waters have been real champions of housing. And they raise, any time you're proposing change of this scale and ambition, there are going to be issues. And I think they've raised a fair issue, which is uh, how do you protect against when you have other kinds of investors, low-income housing tax credits and others that come in, how do you protect against uh, losing that housing? Well, first of all, we're already losing too many units of that housing. So this would help to stop that by bringing in the capital. At the same time, we've learned over the last 50 years that there are ways to protect this housing. Um, And we've proposed a number of those, and we are actually increasing those uh, safety measures in the bill thanks to the the feedback from Barney Frank and, and Maxine Waters. Things like saying, well, even if you end up foreclosing, we're going to make sure that any restrictions on the affordability of the housing, the use of the housing, survives whatever uh, foreclosure process they may be, and giving HUD the ability to redirect that housing to uh, the an owner who's going to keep it affordable long term. So we have a range of protections that we've built in, and I think this is a productive discussion, and we're making progress. Um, before we go on to other things, how does a private investor make money on public housing in the first place with the rents controlled the way they are. If they could make money, why wouldn't the private sector be proposing uh, building housing at this uh, at those rents? Well, it, you need look no farther than the housing authority here in New York City to see creative ways of doing this. The single most important capital source we have for affordable housing in the entire country right now is called the low-income housing tax credit. And basically the way it works is that private investors – put up capital in return for tax breaks that they get for investing in housing. And to do that, it has to be kept affordable over the long term. But right now, because of the restrictions we put on public housing, housing authorities are at a disadvantage. The, the, the public owners of housing 
can't access these other tools that are available to every other kind of owner of affordable housing. So what we're saying is uh, allow, by creating more flexibility in our rules, allow public housing authorities to access that kind of capital. We just did this kind of innovative thing with the housing authority in New York to bring in hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. And that's going to preserve over 20,000 units of public housing that were at risk of loss and didn't have any dedicated funding streams. So that's that's the best example I could give you. U.S. Housing and Urban Development Secretary Sean Donovan, my guest on WNYC. And moving on to other things, you are here today as part of the Obama team sending out various cabinet members across the country, plus the president himself going to Michigan tomorrow, to try and get out a message message about the stimulus or Recovery Act spending. And you'll be with Mayor Bloomberg at a related event, yes? A- absolutely. You know, one of the things about the Recovery Act, there's obviously been lots of focus on the short-term uh, impacts of this economic crisis. And in fact, we're right on track to create or preserve the three and a half million jobs by the end of this year that the that the president promised for the Recovery Act. But the other thing he said from the beginning is let's remember that this economic crisis was a long time coming, that it, it's been over a decade that the middle class, uh, their wage growth has stagnated, that we're not really building the industries of the future in this country. And that's uh, something that the Recovery Act has begun to do. And the particular focus today is on electric vehicles. We're going to announce uh, with Mayor Bloomberg that uh, we're making an investment. The federal government, $15 million, is part, part of a $37 million initiative around the country to install 5,000 electric vehicle charging stations. The very first one uh, we're celebrating here in New York City. Uh, it's one of the nine places. And you know what's amazing about this, Brian, is that Before the Recovery Act, there were only 500 charging stations in the entire country. By 2013, with the Recovery Act, we're going to be up to 20,000. Tomorrow, the president's going to be in Michigan breaking ground on the ninth high-volume battery factory in this country funded by the Recovery Act. We're going to go from 2% of the market uh, to 20% of the worldwide market for batteries by 2012, as a result and 40% of 40 stimu- percent in 2015, all as a result of the stimulus in- investment. Where is that charging station going to be in New York? By the way, where, where will I drive my electric car if I ever get one to charge? Uh, th- this one that we're announcing is in an Edison parking lot uh, on Ninth Avenue and 43rd Street, and uh, it's going to be the first of uh, dozens that are going to be uh, up to 500, in fact, around the, the New York City area. So the message here really is that the stimulus money isn't replacing private investment, as critics say it is. It's fostering it. Well, in fact, if you look at it, we're, we're, uh, our Council of Economic Advisors is going to put out a report today, which shows that for every dollar of investment uh, in the Recovery Act in these kinds of projects, we're getting two and a half dollars on average of private investment. So really, it, it, here's the problem. It, it's very hard for the industry, particularly in a new industry like uh, a clean technology industry, to get off the sidelines when there isn't confidence that the country is moving in that in that direction. You're only going to invest in charging stations if you know that there are cars, uh, electric cars being built. And so all of this really has to happen together. And we've really through the Recovery Act, created an environment for public capital and uh, private capital to come off the sidelines uh, and, and get, get involved. And I'm sure after that report is released that other economists will weigh in and have various takes on it. But is this laying the groundwork for a second stimulus bill? Because this is the biggest policy debate in the media now, if not in Congress. Do we need more stimulus to prevent the economy from sinking into a second recession and a long-term deflationary spiral? Or do we need to cut the deficit more in order to prevent future tax increases and future inflation? And if you're out here promoting how the stimulus bill is promoting private investment, are you laying the political groundwork for stimulus too? Let's be clear that as too often happens, these arguments uh, are, are too black and white. The fact is that in the long term, we absolutely and obviously need to cut the deficit. And we've laid out a plan to do that. Healthcare spending is the number one contributor to the long-term growth of deficit. So we're very focused on that. But let's remember that if the economy shrinks, it's going to be even harder to uh, shrink the deficit because we won't have the tax revenues to be able uh, to help support going forward. So what we need to do is make sure that we're making smart investments. And the president continues to advocate smart, targeted investments 
stimulus to get the, the economy moving even faster than it has. We've had six months in a row of, of job growth. But uh, let's look. We've proposed common sense measures, which broad public supports continuing unemployment benefits. Republicans won't move uh, on that. We've proposed state and local assistance to help keep, keep teachers on the job and other key uh, members uh, uh, of the job force. Uh, we've been stymied on that. 